Why, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 522. It should be 522. I'm hoping it's 522. And if it's not 522, then I apologize if it's not 522. But I'm your host, Agostino Zynga. If it's your first time watching this show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, please leave me a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 star review. Any star review will greatly help the show to get spread. Allow me to get bumped up on the algorithms and all that good stuff. You know, if you want to help me out that way in the free way, please make sure you do that. If you want to help me out in a monetarily, in a monetary way, monetarily, monetary way, then please subscribe to my Patreon at patreon.com for just Agostino. I've got a bonus episode coming at you this Sunday. So make sure you jump on board there. You get one bonus episode per month, per month, per week, actually. Even better, you get one bonus episode per week if you subscribe to my Patreon for as little as one pound, the equivalent of one dollar per month. You get access to my entire Patreon library, archive, whatever you want to call it, with all that bonus content that only you can listen to and only you can watch. Some clips might go up on my main YouTube channel from time to time so I can, you know, do a bit of cross-platform marketing. But the whole content, the entirety of it in full, no as, no nothing, only to be found on patreon.com forward slash Agostino. Don't delay, jump on there today. But yeah, here we are back again. I'm feeling slightly better, as you guys can tell from my voice. Um, I'm still pissed and bummed that I didn't get a chance to DJ today. Although the travel delays and restrictions and all that sort of malarkey happening now in the UK with the strikes. At the moment, if you're not you know aware, we're meant to have um, our night tube in London is meant to restart very soon. And from what I've gathered on the news, again, I haven't paid too close attention to it. It's either to do with pay or something to do with the night tube. The drivers and people who work underground have basically decided to strike because it's an opportune moment because everyone's eyes are kind of, you know, diverted across to the night tube vibes and getting that up and running. So what better way to strike while the iron's hot and start protesting? So they've all decided to walk out, which has obviously led to mass delays in trains and whatnot over the weekend, which obviously isn't beneficial because people usually travel around the weekends and do all sorts of manner of stuff. So that's been a bit disruptive. And of course, with the sports and all that sort of good stuff. But, you know, for the employees themselves, I'm sure they're going to end up getting what they need. But it's not been the easiest time to get around the UK or even parts of London. So I'm a little bit thankful that I didn't, you know, have, I wasn't um, going up to Birmingham. But I am still gutted deep down because I had a whole set prepared. I had all my flipping tunes uploaded on my USB sticks and whatnot. Do you know what I mean? I've been preparing all that stuff, especially my new one. I was going to debut that for the first time in an actual club, you know, like outside of like a pirate studio thing. Ugh, I'm so bummed and I really am. Sicknesses and stuff always come at just the wrong time. Um, they never come when you're actually not doing anything, right? Just when it's like um, it's like when you try and go sober for a bit. You try and go sober, and then for whatever reason, during the time that you're trying to be sober and you're trying to do better yourself, all the best events pop up. People that you've not heard from in ages, you know, tr pop back in your life and want to meet and shit. It's just all these temptations that you never really faced beforehand suddenly rear their ugly mother fucking heads and i hate it i absolutely hate it but you know it is what it is you gotta keep going in it so um here i am the best thing i can do when in sickness is just to create at home because i've got nowhere else to go outdoors so here i am on a saturday night recording again adding another podcast to the arsenal i've got another kind of patreon podcast also going out on the end of the week so hopefully you're going to get that out um sometime midday sunday so if you're not subscribed to the patreon jump on there already if you're not then do that hastily do that hastily but yeah, what else I was thinking about today? Oh, um, randomly thinking today, again, this is probably why people don't like browsing Instagram and shit, because I don't really post on my Instagram too much or interact with it unless it's like a drunken weekend and I'm fucking, you know, drunk DMing random people on my Instagram stories and shit that I just happen to pop on the buy. But for the, for the most part, I don't really, I don't really use it. But then whenever I am whenever I am using it and I check on it, it's always interesting because I've got many people that I follow on there, right? And many friends from, you know, different phases of my life. And it's always interesting whenever you jump on and you just see someone's Instagram story or Instagram post and it's some big life event that you had no idea had taken place prior to the picture they take they took, right? So you click on it, you realize the girl that you knew is super fat. Something happened between the time that you knew her to now. You realize the guy you knew has now got a kid or this girl that you knew now lives in this place. Do you know what I mean? All this weird stuff happens in between. And today I must have opened the app and I opened it and I popped it popped open a post from some guys that I've known for, you know, a number of years. And they all happen to be celebrating another guy that I know in that group's birthday, right? A kind of monumental somewhere in the 30 range birthday. And I was like, damn, man, damn, didn't even get an invite. And I've got to be honest, I felt a bit of a way. 
again, I haven't seen none of these guys in IRL or hung out with them properly. And I'm going to say maybe four years, maybe five I haven't really had a meaningful conversation with them in maybe longer than that. But before that, we were really close, I would imagine, in terms of a group of friends. But for whatever reason, mostly for my 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 fault, because I, 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 I've always said on this podcast, I'm really bad at kind of keeping relationships or cultivating relationships. I tend to kind of just, I tend to be quite transient when it comes to my friendships, right? And relationships in general, when, you know, even romantically. When I'm there, I'm there. When I'm not, I'm not. Um, and then I just pop up randomly and ask you to come out, you know, in the DM. And you're like, who the fuck is this guy? You know what I mean? So I'm that kind of dude, right? And um, yeah, man, I kind of felt a bit away when I saw that post. I'm not going to lie. I kind of felt like, why didn't I get an invite? But then I know if I would have got an invite, I wouldn't have gone. Of course, I couldn't have gone today because I'm sick, right? I'm basically being cooped indoors all week, eating nothing but soup and being tucked into my duvet. But pff, if I was offered to go, I definitely wouldn't have gone. I would have made an excuse or I would have just flaked. So no, I don't usually flake. I usually tell people if I'm not going. I, I'm not usually the guy that doesn't know show. I always say if I'm not going out because I, I, I respect people's time and shit. But I would have done that again. And after a period of time, even if you love somebody and you do enjoy their company and you think they're cool, whatever it may be, there does come a point in time where you must, where every person's going to be like, you know what, enough's enough. I'm fed up of just keeping asking you if you want to come out and I just keep getting met with rejections or you don't turn up and shit. It gets a bit tiring. So I can definitely understand that part of it. But again, you know, maybe it's the selfish, sort of somewhat narcissistic side of me where I still feel like I should have been asked. All right? I should have been asked anyway just so I could say no, <laughs> which is a really messed up way to think about it. But unfortunately, again, this is the one of those unfortunate consequences of getting older, isn't it? Which is why I always tell my younger viewers, especially dudes, man, hold your friends close, especially if you have a small, especially if you're kind of dude who I would, like I was when I was younger, where I was be, I would always kind of be longing for a bigger group of friends. Like I wish I had more friends, wish I had more friends, wish I had more friends, without actually looking after the small group of friends that I had right next to me. I'd always be trying to look for the other one. Because especially when you're in the scene, you're trying to clout chase and shit. You know, things happen, right? You, you look back at yourself, you, you, you get disgusted, you want to bath. But I really have to kind of word, I really have to kind of give advice to my younger listeners out there. Like if you have a small group of friends, cultivate that friendship group, hold them dear, love them dearly, um, respond to their text messages, um, return their phone calls, meet up as often as you can, because it's not, you know, time moves really quickly and moves really slowly. And one minute you could be all like hanging out together, sharing a pizza in a hostel. And the next minute you've not spoken to each other in six years. Do you know what I mean? It could just go so quickly that it can just change in an instant. And it's, and it's pretty impossible to turn it back around, I've found. Yes, you can meet each other again. It's like the old good old days. But in terms of being the same, being in contact with each other all the time, it's never going to be the same again. And it's just really, really unfortunate. Honestly, it really, really is unfortunate because a part of me wishes I still had that friendship group. But unfortunately, my personality in a way that I've made up, I just don't seem to like marry well with like long term relationships or friendships i just don't seem to have it i just don't seem to have the ability to have loads of them i have a couple but i don't have loads do you know what i mean because i just i don't know why i don't know why it's just strange i i, I always think ask myself why that is i don't know why because i have an interesting you know duality in terms of i can be very outgoing but then i could also be a bit of a shutting that's why i probably identify with someone like a dark side feel right dsp the uh, pariah of the internet right somebody who has a, a lot of detractors out there but i also identify with that idea about like just like he just, it's just him, his wife and his cat, nothing else. That's a little bit weird, right? But it's a little bit, you know, there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a school shooter energy going on there. But I have, I have the similar sort of vibe in that I can just completely shut myself off from society and not have any communication with anybody else outside of my immediate circle of close family and friends. And that's it, which is obviously bad. But then when I'm outside, I can also be the life of the party, right? And try and make friends everywhere, right? And be exchanging, flipping, you know, Instagram handles of people and numbers and shit with people you're never going to call again. And just wanting to be a life of the party. You, wanna, want, you want everyone to like me sort of vibe, which is strange. I don't know what that's about. Maybe there's a lot of kind of trauma there. Some Something, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what it is? But regardless, you know, I'm a dude. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to suppress all that shit and keep it moving, innit? That's what guys do. You suppress and you move on as per usual but yeah i saw that and i was like bummed up so yeah young fans or well, young fans my young listeners out there if you are um bemoaning the lack of friends that you have 
I'm sure you have two or three, even one friend that is always there for you. That's always kind of asking you to go out with them or that always got, he's always got your back, all that sort of shit. Stick with that friend. He or she stick with that person. You know what I mean? Um, or if you have a big group of friends, cultivate that friendship group. Check in from time to time, even when it's not about going out, because we do that a lot in the UK. Sometimes you don't like to talk to somebody because you don't want to go out with them to a bar because you don't, you don't want to get offered to go out with a bar because you don't want to go and drink. But sometimes just checking in, a quick phone call. You know what I mean? Fuck it. So I've done that a couple of times. It's been awkward the first couple of times people are like, what are you calling me for? But just checking in, hey man, I hope you're good. It just crossed my mind. I don't want anything. I'm not asking for money. I don't want a favor. I just want to check in and see if you're fine. And people usually appreciate that sort of shit. Um, but again, you've got to make this first step in it. And I'm usually not the guy that makes the first step either because I'm a little bit, I've got a little bit of an ego, pride, blah, 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 blah. But yeah, I saw that and I was like, God damn it, man. Why wasn't I invited to this party? But again, I would have probably said no. But hey, what can you do? We move on, innit? We move on. We move on. Life, life, is, life is what you make of it, innit? In the, in the kind of interim. Anyway, moving on. Um, next on the list, we'll talk about quickly here. Hellbound on Netflix. I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's another blockbuster South Korean TV series on Netflix at the moment called Hellbound, coming straight off the back of Squid Game, of course, that blew everyone's mind and that I kind of reviewed on my podcast and I said it was a little bit overrated. I understand why people loved it because we've been starved of good TV. Right, I'm actually gonna yeah speak about that later about Succession, but we've been scarred of good TV. The TV on right now is mediocre. People are raving. The f- most thing I heard people raving most about is stuff like Ted Lasso, which is pretty average. But again, it's an easy watch. Um, it's kind of you know you can kind of turn your brain off and kind of you know snigger snigger away or snigger 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 chuckle away as you're watching the series. But when it comes to Squid Game and Hellbound, the reason why they captured everyone's imagination because that's it. They were absolutely creative they were original they actually seemed like a tv series that somebody spent time imagining different scenarios that weren't just common tropes or traits that you've basically seen in every other series you know that came before it they actually tried to do something new and interesting and guess what it kind of worked bits of squid game were good bits of hellbound hellbound were good but overall pretty decent tv series especially considering it's a foreign tv series that you have to watch either with subtitles or dubbed personally when it comes to foreign tv series i like to always watch it um subtitled i don't ever like to watch it dubbed the freaks who like watching it dubbed are weird to me Um, i always want to read and just hear the actual native speakers speak in their language i know you miss a lot with the translations anyway because there's loads of things that get lost in translation um little phrases and the way they kind of you know say particular sentences and whatnot it happens a lot in gomorrah if you watch gomorrah and you know a little bit of italian you'll know the subtitles aren't the greatest especially because of the dialect of italian they they speak in naples is slightly different to what you know uh, regular italians in kind of rome or milan speak so there's a little bit of a you know um lack of translation that way or you just can't translate certain phrases you know back and forth it doesn't really make that much sense i'm sure the same thing happened with squid game and hellbound but overall as a story as a plot character development you know whatever it may be you got what was going on and it gripped everyone it took everybody by the fucking balls and i think hellbound might be the same very very original sort of idea essentially um it's a tv series based on what do you call it? You said like eternal damnation, right? Like the day of judgment. So essentially people in South Korea, for some reason, um, this weird ghostly figure pops up around them in their lives and basically tells them when they're going to die. It's either going to be, you know, imminently in like the next 10 seconds, or it might be sometime in the future, like 20 years. And essentially then, you know, they have a time between them to basically get their affairs in order before those three demons there on the right hand side jump out from the flipping ground and chase them around and beat them bloody. For some reason, they have to beat them up before they basically eviscerate them and it's basically into ash and condemn them into hell or basically right it's either hell or they just basically die on the spot i'm not sure what happens to their souls but something happens right so it's, it's a bit of a gruesome tv series but what the interesting part about it is that they've done a little spin obviously in the modern day in that for whatever reason this like weird um cult again these are all spoiler alerts by the way because <laughs> i'm spending the whole thing but what makes me interesting is that um this weird cult um basically latches on to these um these, these demons and basically someone in that cult decides to go around and um secretly do their own versions of whatever these hellbound monsters do as a way to kind of justify their their own cause 
so that they'd go around and they'd kind of kidnap somebody that might be a paedophile and, you know, um, put them in an incinerator and then dump their body somewhere random so people would think it was those demons. So people would be like, oh yeah, shit, that person was da 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 da. So everyone that's dying is obviously somebody that did something bad. But obviously that's not how it works, right? Um, we all know, you know, that's one of the common questions sort of atheists have, right? If you believe in Christ, why does Christ give babies cancer and shit or leukemia, right? And condemn them to hell in that regard or condemn them to, you know, whatever, right? Whatever. There, there's a conversation there to be having in terms of um, religion. But just in terms of an original TV series, that premise is fucking brilliant, right? And news here, courtesy of Variety, says that Hellbound creator Yong Sang-ho details season two plans, teases third zombie movie in a world of trains. So in World of Train to Busan, because the same director that did that um, movie, which I've heard is incredibly scary. But again, I don't do horror movies. I wouldn't say Hellbound was a horror. I'd say it was more like a holof horror thriller slash sort of thing it's not the most gory or scary thing in the world either the monsters are quite you know scary the first time you see them but after a while you get kind of used to it um it's quite funny when you see the people getting beaten up before they get eviscerated that's always quite funny it's like they're going to hell anyway just send them to hell why do you have to fucking beat them bloody and blue and fling them off the side of a fucking building before you you know burn them to hell but hey um let's quickly read this article it says netflix um, latest genre offering from korea dark sci-fi thriller okay that's what it's called it's called a sci-fi thriller Okay, I'd call it a horror thriller, but a sci-fi thriller. Hellbound doesn't waste any time in getting straight to the action. In the first minutes of the pilot, giant bellowing, um, billowing, sorry, um, demons think the Hulk meets evil Michelin man erupt from the heart of Seoul to torture and scorch to death one of the damned members of the public. That is literally damned. The show is set in an alternate reality in which angels appear before an individuals. Okay, those things are angels. Interesting. That's one thing I was going to ask. They don't really have angels depicted too tough on there in terms of you know taking you the opposite way it's just all going to hell um when the time comes the demons barrel onto earth to meet out their grisly um death sentence in the orbit is the new truth a cult-like group of individuals that supports the supernatural arbiters uh, justice led by a legit led by an insidious grandmaster jong sin so hellbound creator young sang ho is perhaps best known internationally for the date um to date for the acclaimed zombie thrillers train to busan and peninsula the former live action film starring gong ho as a father shepherding his daughter to safety amid zombie apocalypse was preceded by an animated prequel called soul station released the same year similarly hellbound began life as a two-part anime Made film before being sent into a webtoon to, for career digital platform Naver. The latter provided a handy proof of concept for the live action series that was ultimately commissioned by Netflix. The show is currently the stream's top non English language series globally, just ahead of the other non Korean TV sensation Squid Game. Wow, it's commissioned by Netflix. Okay, I'm actually curious to actually see what the animation um, version of this is actually what is actually like. Because I imagine it's quite gory and probably a lot better than the actual live action. But the live action I thought was pretty decent. Again, without watching the first. In interview with Variety working on a translator provided by Netflix, Yun describes discusses the origin of Hellbound, plans for season two and teases a potential third installment. Okay, cool. Let's see what season two is saying. I want to quickly skip to that question. What is saying? Number protagonist. Do you have a concept? Blah 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 blah. Yeah, cool. Could that be what uh, with Netflix in the future? What are the plans for season two? I will say that is true. The process of working with Netflix was very enjoyable on my end. They are very much agreed to and related to my covert vision, but they also created an environment where I didn't have to think about anything else aside from focusing on my creativity in terms of distribution or when or how to release a series. Because Hellband is based on the original webtoons, my partner Choi Kyu Suk and I have decided that story towards so the story afterwards will be told first for uh, first through the webtoon and as for whether we would want to return into another live action series that's something that we will need to have further discussions on as you know we have already just we only just released hellbound season one so we didn't have any time to discuss the issue with netflix so i would say that this is something we need further discussion on i like how for some reason i, I guess because the contracts for squid game and hellbound were initially always one season that's what netflix always does right they always kind of just bang out a season if it doesn't work after free they'll just dump it right they just keep hammering through money again but i guess with these South Korean ones because they're all original series and they're foreign TV series you know maybe the investment is not as heavy and maybe the success metrics aren't as high so anything they can get back from it in terms of viewerships is a win and then if they get a bonus and it becomes an international hit like Squid Game did they can then easily commission a season two and ride that into the sunset maybe that's a thing because it's interesting that they haven't even discussed because the Squid Game guy said the same thing 
He didn't even think about a season two. He had a rough plan, but it wasn't something he discussed in at length with uh, Netflix. But for some reason, it just hit, and then boom, it took off. And then you know now Netflix are offering those guys bonuses and whatnot and changing their contracts. Da, 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 da. So yeah, Hellbound season two may be coming out very soon. But I definitely recommend you check it out if you're again stuck for things to watch and you're bemoaning the lack of quality now on modern streaming platforms at the moment. Definitely check out Hellbound on Netflix. Definitely one of the better series. Again, like I said, I much prefer to watch it with subtitles. I don't like dubbed versions. I think you lose a lot of the essence and the feel um, for the original series, especially without hearing the native speaker speak. I know you don't understand the language. Most people don't if you're not Korean or you don't understand the language, but definitely it does add something to the overall experience. So definitely recommend you check out Hellbound. Available now on Netflix. Uh, next on the list, moving on. We're quickly, let's just move on to this. It's like a quick trainer topic. This is courtesy of Lace Up HK. It's an Instagram page that has somehow managed to get their hands on a soon to be released Jound New Balance 990 V3s. This might be iteration number four, I think. There were two kind of, yeah, and then a black navy colorway. Yeah, I think this might be edition number four. So it looks like these sneaker brands, for the most part, when they're collaborating with legitimate kind of what would you call them when, when, they're legit, when they're collaborating with like legitimate or let's say respected figures within streetwear or within menswear or whatever you want to call this space it looks like most of them aren't trying to do the one hit and done they're usually trying to sign contracts where they are able to do several different projects several different shoes several different capsule collections or just maybe even build up to the capsule collections going forward you don't really see a lot of one hits and dones anymore there's no more one night stands when it comes to collaborations it feels like all the bigger brands realize the value that these guys and girls bring to their brand the eyes that they bring the customers the inbuilt customers they have they're going to bring into what they do and they hope that they can kind of get a bit of that rub and ride that into the sunset and it looks like new balance is no different they've definitely kind of backed out the brinks trucks um with new with kind of jound and gave him the ability to do these which also is great because it feels like maybe i'm not i don't know if it's true but are new balance and reebok owned by the same company or are they completely separate? Because that's also interesting that he's allowed or he's be, he's been given the license to continue doing collaborations with Reebok um, despite his close connection or his close relationship, working relationship with New Balance. They're both athletic shoe brands. We'd imagine there'd be some sort of exclusivity deal because that's what Nike does, right? When you do a collaboration or you're married up with Nike, it's very rare people that are with Nike decide to go to Adidas or whatever, right? Unless you're like, um, what's his face? Unless you're like that guy that did that shoe, the Air Max one that I'm thinking of. Because he kind of got booted off a night, supposedly, right? Is that the story that goes? Supposedly, did he nick something or something? Or what happened? He fell out with somebody and then he went to Adidas and made those shoes that everyone hates and clowns him on. But yeah, it doesn't really work that way in terms of, you know, being able to work for all the brands. I wish it could. I wish we could get to a point in, in kind of culture where you could work for New Balance and do a shoe. Then you could jump on Asics. Then you could go to Mizuno. Then you could go to Diodora. Then you could jump to Adidas. And then you could go to Nike. Right, off the, you could go to Nike off the back of an Adidas collab. I wish that could be a thing. I really do. Like, imagine if, like, for instance, um, Nike wanted to collaborate with Kanye specific, specifically on his shoe. Right, so it wouldn't be the, it wouldn't be anything to do with Adidas or Yeezy. It'd be a separate thing that Ye kind of does. Let's say underneath that moniker, that'd be sick. In the same way that Matthew Williams is able to do collaborations with Nike under his moniker of like Matthew M Williams, and then he's also able to do shoes with Nike under Alix. Right, and I'm sure if he wants to and do a collaboration with Givenchy, that'll come under Givenchy, right? Designed obviously by Matt Williams, sort of thing. Um, Virgil obviously does a similar sort of thing with Off White when he does a shoe with Nike in that way. That'll be pretty decent. I, I would honestly really, 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 really like to see that going forward, but they don't. Um, the only person I can think of who's slightly maybe in that sort of ilk is maybe Hiroshi Fujiwara, but even him, I can't think of a, an official Adidas collaboration that he'd done. What I can remember him doing back in the day when Adidas was start, Adidas was. Yeah, when it felt like I, at the time when Adidas were starting to get their feet wet with the whole Adidas Originals thing, and they were starting to remake all the Adidas campuses in their original shapes, with the you know this with the original lacing and the kind of flat outsole and all that sort of stuff with the Adidas 80s and all the campuses, all that sort of attention to detail was getting sorted out. And obviously, a lot of those shoes were very popular around the 
80s when all those guys were coming up in Harajuku and whatnot and traveling to the New York and, you know, going to flipping record stores and whatnot and hanging out with James Jebby back in the day. All those shoes are very popular. I remember he was actually wearing a couple of those shoes on Instagram page and basically flexing and being like, oh, yeah, I remember this when I was flipping 15. You know what I mean? And I'm 76 now, you know. I love Hiroshi. I'm, not, I'm joking around. But I wish I could be a thing. But anyway, moving on. Fourth iteration of Jound and New Balance, 9 and 0 V3. They now come in what looks like some sort of washed or somehow, yeah, kind of a washed out pastel looking olivey kind of colorway. Um, maybe I would say, I would go as far as to say these might be the weakest of the shoes of the four so far that have come out from the Jound studio in terms of an overall colorway. I do like the fact that they do have this thing that they do with um, New Balance. Or just in terms of the color selection. That's one thing I'm going to say. Even though I don't like the, the, the colorway, I do like the application of thought that's going into it. Like, for instance, the N on the shoe, it looks like it's black. It looks like it's dark navy. But actually, when you go to the next slide, it's more of a green, right? It's more like of a really dark green that they basically put on the end. And I love the idea of how they use different colors. Like, again, with like the previous New Balance, like from afar, it looks like it's all black. But when you once you go up close, it's a really dark blue almost similar to like you know when people they say um um guys from what's that country in africa it's like sudan they have that sort of tint in terms of their skin where they're so dark there's almost i remember my mom saying it like when she went there when she was younger like it's, it's a beautiful to see them in terms of skin color because they're so dark they're almost purple it's almost like a bluey cobalty like colorway do you know what i mean it's really really funny it's really really uh, f um interesting to see somebody with that sort of skin tone right? i mean baking in the sun glistening it looks amazing i think they did a good job with how they casted the models in that shoot too but i love the application of the colors just not a fan of the actual makeup and how it looks put on the shoe and i think easily these might be the weakest or the ones that people will end up skipping on the most obviously not this is the funny thing about shoes and collaborations, right? These obviously, in my opinion, again, just, you know, speaking from my expert opinion when it comes to shoes and shit, after many years of buying them and being part of the scene, I would easily say that these are the weakest ones. If you were to sell all four at once, these would definitely be the ones that would sell out last. But because we're living in a hype era and because people love collaborations, they're still going to sell out regardless because Jound and Justin Saunders, his name fucking rings heavy, right? He's got, he's got real clout in the game and people just want to have a pair of Jounds on their feet. And again, if you're into a New Balance hype and you want to get something that isn't a GR, what better way than to get this shoe because you're not going to find that colorway ever again in fucking retail, right? That's one thing as well. That's one thing New Balance do really, really well. I've got to give them credit. Unlike Nike, when you do a collaboration with them, they don't just immediately go out six months later and put it out as a GR. They give you some time to kind of enjoy your fucking collab, right? To enjoy the exclusivity of it. Like, and just, especially if you're, if you're the person designing it, let alone the person that bought it. Imagine you queued up, you spent all day F5ing and then you turn around and they're selling the same fucking makeup of colorway, similar-ish in fucking office and size and shit. You'll be spitting feathers, you know what I mean? But yeah, these could easily be the weakest if they all released it four. If they release all four at once, but they don't, they're quite smart. They drop them all individually. And because they're a collaboration, they're still going to sell out regardless. But, you know, I'm not really a big fan of the overall makeup um, of the colorways in general, but I like the application. Again, I like the clever use of the dark tones when it comes to the greens. Um, I'm sure that insole is probably, or the inland lining is probably the same sort of colorway. I love the lack of branding or the subtlety of the branding on the entire thing. I think with the exception of that jound, um, stamp that looks like on the back of the reflected tip, which is obviously screen printed. There's nothing else, no else of iconography. I'm sure they've got something going to insole, but that's about it. So yeah, really nice to see. Um, supposedly it's coming in next week. Supposedly that's what they're saying. I haven't really seen any news on that. Courtesy of John, let's see what he's saying. I haven't seen any news of him saying it's going to be next week. Um, so far, but maybe something has changed that I've completely missed. Let's see what they're saying here, in terms of next week. It's funny, man. I was on this, honestly. Jound is a page I used to watch of check from back in the day. I remember a couple of my pictures that I used to take in terms of street style were actually uploaded on his blog back in the day, which is quite a cool little claim to fame, I think. Mm, is it a claim to fame? It's cool, really, to say you've got your picture of your own shoes appeared on the blog that no one could tell are yours? Not really, probably. But anyway, um, yeah, I don't see any information about the new, new balances on here. People are lying. Oh, these new boots are fucking bad. Bad. These are some bad boy boots. Uh, are they, are they um, how do you call them? Okay, I thought they are demon. Okay, they're Dana boots. Especially these on the right. Oof, fucking fire, man. But they both look great. So again, great. I, I just love the subtlety of their colorways. They tend to kind of always, you know, um, go for uh, very subtle kind of colorway combos, but still colorway combos that you're not, you can't specifically get like from the brand themselves. 
but still something that kind of harkens back to the archive still looking fresh and modern but yeah anyway new balances coming soon not sure when they drop not sure when they drop Next news in terms of sneakers to move on quickly here. We have news courtesy of Hypebeast of another Pata Air Max one for your head top. If you thought the other three were too much, they got to give you one more and maybe another one after this. Again, this is the scourge and one of the negatives of modern sneaker culture at the moment. Modern sneaker culture at the moment is a uh, real mindfuck, right? It's the best it's ever been, in my opinion, because I think the collaborations are coming thick and fast. You get, oh, thick and fast. Pause, right? Pause that one. Pause a little bit. Anyway, right? Um, there's a lot of collaborations from, you know, all different types of brands. Um, you don't always have to go pick for the Adidas and Nikes or the, you know, the other, you know, the brands on the outskirts, the New Balances, the Pumas, the Asics, the Mizunos the uh, whatever that one with the kangaroo is all those brands are doing some great shit at the moment and then they also tend to collaborate with some interesting brands studios uh, stores who then get a chance to you know have their you know have their kind of vision seen on the sneaker and generally that kind of lends for better selection for us you and i customers to choose from but then the other thing that's annoying about it is that even though there's more of us buying these shoes and there's more companies making these shoes there's still a lack of shoes to go around. There's still an artificial scarcity that's installed in a system that's made um, to kind of keep us in this rat race where we're continually waking up at 9 a.m. to try and log on to sneakers to get a chance to win a raffle, to get a chance to buy a shoe with your hard-earned money, which is something that still will not sit right in my soul because when I grew up, a raffle meant you'd bought a ticket for one pound so that you could have a chance to win something that was way, what that was kind of worth considerably more than your fucking ticket of your, of your raffle. So maybe you might win a TV, a fridge, a bicycle that you don't need, whatever. But the whole point of buying a raffle ticket so that you could win something that far exceeded the individual price of it. And now raffles mean have a chance to win a shoe or have a chance to buy a shoe that you also don't have a chance to get in your side. It's like bullshit. So I hate all that artificial scarcity. It fucking does my head in. But at least with Pata, they're trying to do things the right way. They did a little in-store release. People can eat, had to queue up in the morning. They sorted people out. I've seen from people that I know who have been in the scene for time and kind of quote-unquote pay their dues that fucking bullshit line ASI tried to give me in turn trying to sell me in that regard, which I've always fucking hated. But yeah, that kind of paid your dues kind of marquee, you know, title, name, whatever it's called. I've seen people getting them. But in all in, due, all, in all, I have seen people that, I've seen whoever won these shoes online so far. I've seen that they've kind of got them. I don't. I haven't seen many people who have kind of been crying and moaning. They haven't been able to get them. And then for whatever reason, the resale on these is really good. I don't know why people aren't necessarily keeping these or why there's, there's, the resale is so low. Maybe because they made a lot of them. I don't know. But the resale on these is still pretty, pretty insane considering how beautifully constructed they are, in my opinion. But again, I still think there is a saturation problem. How much is enough? Like now that we've got them in black, is there going to be another colorway coming out of these Pata Air Max ones? Are they necessary? Again, I love the black because again, I'm a sucker for black. If they would have just popped that swoosh in silver, right? Or maybe, yeah, in a, if they popped that swoosh in a silver, I would have, you know, Jeremy, I could ejaculate in my trousers right now. If the swoosh, uh, the main swoosh and the little swoosh down the mud guard with silver, you could take my money right now easily, easily take my money. But in just in terms of a sneaker head, sneaker collector sort of vibe, it gets a little bit annoying when you think you've got a special shoe and then suddenly the next week, another one. The next week, another one. Next week, another one. And then it would be worse if the resale for this was really high. If you went on StockX and you bought one for like a, a grand and then the next week another one comes out that devalues yours to 700 and now that one's four you'd be crying into your fucking nike box so that's the only issue i have with it slightly but in terms of a shoe in terms of a quartet of shoes or whatever i think it's four right uh brown orange how many how many are there how many are there how many are there how many are there nike air max one patter is it Let's just do it. Should I check? I can't bother to check. But yeah, you know. I think there's four. I'm not going to search. But yeah, they do look fucking beautiful. Let's not deny that. That shape, man. I don't know what they did. They must have They must have changed the tooling for it. Or maybe it's the wave pattern on the mud guard. It's Air Max 1. But I've legitimately never seen a new retro Air Max 1. Sans a little um, 
sands a little, what's those things called? Those little shoe things that you help to kind of stuff the toe. Sands those shoe things or tissue or someone's foot or somebody wearing pin rolls or pointing their feet down to the ground. I've honestly never seen a Nike Air Max 1 without anything inside it, just looking like that on a, on, on a table, still maintain that shape, that silhouette, that little triangle point at the front exquisite absolutely exquisite i'm not going to lie absolutely exquisite they absolutely went in on these these look fucking banging but oh it's getting a little bit tiring i'm not gonna be honest but anyway let's continue with the with the article it says after releasing the nike air max one in noise aqua pata is set to add another colorway to the collaboration um collection or the collaborative collection sorry constructed using premium white leather new buck and silver reflective mesh um this premium iteration sees the similar set of color blocking as the previous releases in the jagged wavy pattern suede leather overlays in black give way to the mudguard quartet and heel so what is that mudguard leather is it suede it's, it's suede oh oh that is beautiful isn't it oh that is beautiful um more details come in embroidered mini swoosh to complete the look the cell swoosh midsole atop of the free tone the outsole debuts in december you can get pate max one in black usd at nike the collab will also come with a co-branded custom box so they're available already now oh no the debut in december sorry it's not now they're leaving december so yeah another one for the head top another pate max one i'm not sure how i feel about it i'm really not too sure i think it's a bit too much i think they're doing way too much for these but you know uh what can you do what can you do? Let's move on. In let's move on. Next on the list, what do we have to talk about here? Um, yes, let's talk about this quickly. So, gentrification is one of those interesting topics that never really makes sense to me because I've never really heard a stringent or coherent or sense-making argument for it, especially in the kind of um, everyday scenario. Especially in the kind of everyday scenario that we've kind of encountered. Especially if you live in the inner city. You've definitely got anecdotal evidence of people who have kind of lived in dilapidated areas of, you know, wherever you're from. Um, young people who then suddenly turn that area into a hip area, a happening area, a place that people want to go and start businesses and commerce and hang out and whatnot, which naturally brings along with it property developers who then want to build properties in order to house those people. And then for whatever reason, people from outside of town come in and then complain about the very same people who laid the roots and made that area what it is. Um, because, you know, they don't like the noise or they don't like the, the, the traffic or whatever it may be. And then suddenly, you know, because those guys are paying, you know, hundreds of millions in terms of rents and mortgages for those places or just outright for the apartments, um, the councils usually buck to their every demand. And then the originators, the people that actually laid the groundwork or laid the foundations for that area, get booted out. And then the rest is history, rinse and repeat. And I never understood it. I really haven't never understood it. Although that being said, I have been known to kind of always kind of um, take the side of the property developers when I've been in the house party, right? If you're in a house party and people are, you know, going on this whole group thinks cho chorus um, about, you know, whatever kind of social topic they want to speak about, it's interesting just to kind of put a, the cat amongst the pigeons and just say, yeah, I'm pro gentrification, just to see what people say. Obviously, I'm not pro for it, especially in the way that it's done here in this article, but it's just a good, interesting thing to do in terms of a house party vibe, because sometimes the most boring things to do when you're in a house party is just to sit there and hear people kind of bellowing on and on about Brexit and how they would have done different. And it's like, bruv, you didn't even vote. You're not even from this country. You probably weren't even awake when the election was taking place or the vote was taking place. Like, relax, you know what I mean? Allow me. But anyway, let's move on. This is Kershaw Rolling Stones. It's an article titled Manchester's Night and Day Cafe Faces Closure Due to Ongoing Noise Complaint, right? And it's a petition about this legendary cafe in Manchester called Night and Day that's facing some uh, uncertain future due to some un, uh, unappreciative neighbours, let's say. So it says here, the following. The owner of Manchester's Night and Day says they faced a threat of closure after being handed a noise ambient, a, a, sorry, a noise abatement notice. The venue, which was hosted early shows for the likes of the Arctic Monkeys, My Chemical Romance, Elbow and Snow Patrol, that's a fucking lineup and a half, has reportedly handed a notice, has been handed a notice by Manchester City Council earlier this month after facing a noise complaint from a nearby resident. So one Karen decided to, you know, effectively set the cat amongst the pigeons in her way. Um, night and day has served a noise abatement notice because you know it's a woman no way this is a guy 
I can't believe a guy would go all to this way to, I don't know, make me personally, I think it's a woman, but I don't know what you guys think. Um, they went on to claim that the council believes that the venue is a noise um, nuisance and has threatened to close the grassroots venue for good. In the wake of the new ruling, Night and Day Cafe has shared a new petition for gig goers to show their support, which I'm going to show you later. On the petition page, organizers said the latest dispute had arisen from a single complaint, right? And this is the thing I have about gentrification. Let's imagine for, let's, let's just play devil's advocate and say, you know, maybe there is some real, there's a real argument to be said for maybe um, the OG residents not having a great relationship with the new residents and not, or not even trying to meet them in the middle. Because I remember watching a documentary about residents in, I'm going to say parts of like Stoke Newington or Dalston when that whole Hackney curfew thing was happening, right? Or yeah, when they were trying to close most bars and pubs to 12, I think it's, that's what's occurred. Most bars and pubs around the area don't have to close around 12 or something, right? It kind of fucked up a lot of those places. I think that's when the dance tunnel ended up closing. And in this documentary, it profiled somebody who lived local from that area who basically said, it's a nightmare every time he wakes up on a Saturday or Sunday morning because in his hallway from where he lives in his flat and apartment building, there's obviously a nice little... Um, door that you go in before you go up the stairs but obviously that people use that little doorway as a makeshift toilet so they've, he's found all sorts of shit there needles people's sick condoms you know vomit whatever it may be called right so every morning you're waking up having to go take your dog for a walk and you don't know if you're going to step in someone's shit or you're going to step in someone's sick so i could definitely understand there having to be some sort of middle ground mediation but also, let's imagine the whole building's complaining about that issue. Then, you know, unfortunately, if the club doesn't take notice or doesn't correct the behavior of their patrons or, you know, they don't try and make some sort of effort to try and, you know, uh, uh, mitigate for those sort of things, then you might have to face the threat of closure. But for one person to threaten the livelihood of an entire building, of an entire establishment that has so much rich history in that community is absolutely insane. Like the powers of... the the. The, the power imbalance is too skewed to the new residents. It should be just 50-50. It shouldn't be all to the you know, OG residents. It doesn't mean if you were there before, you could just get away with bloody murder. But there should be some level of mediation. It shouldn't be like, oh, the moment these new residents panic, or the, the moment these new residents complain, the council panics and starts shaking. Do you know what I mean? And automatically make some changes. It's really annoying. It's the same thing with police. As soon as police report um, a fight outside of a club or something, that suddenly the, 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 the flipping council starts shaking, especially if it involves black people, and then the licenses get taken away or they limit the hours of operation. Shit. In the wake of the new rule, the Night and Day Cafe has shared a new petition. It's a June lockdown. Duh, duh, duh. Um, it continues here. As the restrictions lifted, the life returned to the surrounding Northern Quarter area, which is lovely in Manchester. We were able to put on a few of our first live music events. The resident visited us the next day and has since reported us to Manchester City Council a number of times. What an absolute narc. We haven't met the residents a number of times to explain what we do and what and nothing has changed um, operationally to how we operated pre-lockdown and the 28 years prior to that. Exactly. Imagine having 28 years of history. Obviously, I said before, you don't get preferential treatment. But sometimes if you have 28 years history in the place, maybe you should get preferential treatment. Maybe people should be able to say, you know what? Allow them in it. They've been here since this place started. You know, they get the they get the say so. They should have some sort of sway or whatever. Like, ga ga ga. It continues here. It says, We ask for Manchester City Council um, licensing to remove our noise abatement on notice for the council to address the real issue here, which is the housing with ill considered planning and construction has been approved and built next to a pre existing live music business. Exactly. I never have got that. Same thing happened with the cause. You built, or maybe the cause is not a good example because they effectively built that temporary nightclub in the f knowing full world they were going to get moved and it was like a temporary thing before the buildings went up. But I never got understood these property developers moving um, or property developers building on a space where there's next to a bustling nightclub or loads of kind of youth activities and then those very same neighbors getting annoyed by it. it's like those guys are here before you were my friend let's have some common sense here um it says here the the Night and Day is located on 26 Oldman Street. Over the last 15 years, flats have been built on existing buildings, converted to flats around us with no real thought or consideration to the pre-existing businesses, building and what it does. According to the official government guidance, councils are obliged to investigate noise complaints that could be deemed um, statutory notice as per the Environmental Protection Act 1990. And I know all about that shit. Most of the places I used to play at or promote at had some sort of noise complaint going on throughout the years, which eventually 
actually led to most of these places closing. Maybe there's some other finagle stuff happening too, but most of it had to do with that. It says that if they can, if they, if they can then agree to the, with the complaint, the person responsible is handled an abatement notice. These are um, those responsible could be forced to pay consist costly fines for every time they fail to comply. While councils are also able to apply for the high court for an injunction if the prosecution is not adequate. Under the current government legislations, property developers are responsible for managing the impact of noise when building properties in the area where noise man emanates from the long established venues it's known for actually yeah but they don't do it do they um to be clear, or Majesty Council said, to be clear, the council has not threatened night and day with closure. A noise abatement notice has been issued following the complaint of an excessive noise. A NAN cannot be used to close a venue. It is used to prevent continued noise nuisance. But you know, you know what that, you know what that road is. It's a slippery slope. If that person is willing to meet with them and still complain, they've definitely got, you know, the bit between their teeth. They're not going to let up either. Night and day is not going to let up. So more, so usually you'd imagine something will have to give. And if there's enough complaints with the person that's paying the most, right? They're probably going to side with them, especially when it's a raise. I don't know. It's just I, that's what I like about it, the unfairness of it. But yeah, um, the 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 petition I put in the show notes of the show. It's called Remove Our Noise Abatement Notice, but I'll put the link in the show note description. So definitely check it out and sign it. Get involved. Help these guys out. Legendary venue shouldn't be closed or be threatened with the uh, threat of closure due to one person who moved in there recently deciding that they don't want everyone else to have a bit of fun. It's absolutely heinous. Uh, moving on from that one let's talk about this quickly this is courtesy of vulture 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 interesting development so this is about the grammys right allegedly the grammys or allegedly supposedly i haven't even seen the whole list but um what is it marilyn manson louis ck and i think david Chappelle, right um have got nominations for their work and i guess people are getting their panties in a twist because they thought all three of those guys were cancelled so why are cancelled people getting awarded awards at these mainstream award ceremonies you know interesting question to have but you know let's read the grammy ceo said he's sing. she said the following as it as as is the case every year the 2022 Grammy nominations were full of some surprising names. From the 11-time nominee John Baptiste to the first-timers like ABBA. First time ABBA's been nominated for a Grammy. Okay. When people are complaining nowadays about Grammys, like, let's just, okay, let's just continue. Um, Selena Gomez. Um, there was also names that made for more uncomfortable surprises. Dr. Luke, Marilyn Manson, and Lucy K. Now, the Dr. Luke thing is interesting because after the allegations came out about him, was the sexual misconduct with an ex-girlfriend or something? I don't know. Didn't read too much into it. Don't really give a fuck. But the funny thing about it, all this virtual signaling, is that Doja Cat, I think there's a few tracks on her album. I'm not sure. Maybe it might be the, the one of the singles. Was produced by Dr. Luke. After the allegations came out. And no one scrapped that. No one said anything. No petitions got done. So people are very selective with their outrage. If it's somebody they like... They don't have anything to say. If it's somebody they don't like, suddenly they have everything else to say. This is basically the name of the game. And you're going to see this common theme running through with something else I'm going to talk about later. But anyway, it continues here. Let's read that again. There were also names that made for more uncomfortable surprises. Dr. Luke, Marilyn Manson and Lucy Kay. Three men accused of varying forms of sexual abuse and assault. Dr. Luke's three nominations for writing and producing on Doja Cat's Kiss Me More and Planet Her Deluxe, as well as the Sweetie and Doja Cat Best Friend. He produced all those fucking hits, right? Were not his um, first since Kesha accused him of sexual abuse. After he was nominated for Record of the Year 2020 for Doja Cat Say So. Again, has she said anything about it? No. Did she take that song off her album? No. Again, virtue signaling nonsense. But Mason's two nominations for writing on Kanye's Jail in Best Rap Song and CK's one for Sincerely Lucy K, which is a fucking brilliant stand-up special. Maybe one of the better ones, actually. Especially considering how long he was out, um, you know, from doing stand-up and being prevented from going up on certain shows because people would boo or walk out of shows. The fact that he was able, still able to p deliver that level of a stand-up um, special basically proves that he's a special breed. I mean, he's up there with the Dave Chappelle's in terms of freak of nature, in terms of stand-up. Him, Bill Burr, Dave Chappelle, they're in a kind of league of their own, really. Um, it continues here, says, we're the first since the allegations. Addressing the nominations in the interview with Rap um, Recording Academy CEO Harvey Mason Jr. Oh, he's got the first name as a Weinstein. It continues, um, said the Grammys won't restrict. There's an interesting point here. Harvey Mason Jr. said this, the CEO of the Grammys. They said, won't restrict the people who can submit their material for consideration. He continued, 
we look we won't look back at people's history we won't look at their criminal record we won't look at anything other than the legality within our rules is this recording for this work eligible based on the date and other criteria and i think in my opinion that's how it should always be because what ends up happening is that if you want to be the moral police and if you want to have morality and ethics included in these sort of things i'm all for it cool but let's do it across the board let's not just do it to people we don't like let's apply morality and ethics to every single person that gets nominated whether it's somebody you like or don't like but no one wants to do that because if you do that you're gonna have some very uncomfortable conversations because some of your faves are included in those cancellation conversations you know what i mean they should be included too if you're going to cancel this person you also have to look at that person for working with the person that you think might be cancelled those conversations need to be had as well but people don't do that people want to pick and choose who they want to cancel which is why i think in general cancel culture is gay as fuck and i absolutely hate it because in my opinion i would much prefer we live in a world where we all decided as a society to say you know what we don't fuck with this guy because he said something that nowadays in society we don't like and as a society we decide that we don't want to back him anymore and then if his career dies a slow death it dies a slow death in the question of the baby if the baby's fans like what he still does and don't care what he says on the stage they should still be allowed to go and see him on shows um see him at festivals and buy his stuff without being shamed or whatever mocked online whatever you should be allowed to still be a the baby fan and do your thing and you should also be able to find his music easily his music should be on playlists it should be on the first page of the discovery thing all that sort of stuff should be allowed on his behalf because his fans are still backing him but the grand public they're allowed to say we don't want to fuck with him and if his career again dies or so if it does but what we got nowadays is this institutional industry type cancellation where they decide to turn off your lights they decide, the industry decide, hey, we're not going to allow you to eat. We're going to be the ones to turn it off. And then the, vi the, vocal, the vocal minority are not your fans anyway. They're the ones also keep continuing, you know, um, cheering on the pylon, bringing out their fucking torches and shit, right? Ironically enough, and trying to light you up even more. That's why I don't like about it. Counterculture should work in terms of you taking personal responsibility to say, this, what this person did, I don't like. So it's now tainted the art they produce. So I've taken a personal responsible, a personal um, responsibility to not back anything they do. So I'm like personally deciding to cancel them because for me, they've, they've crossed the line and I can't see them the same again. Cool, no worries. But then let the fans enjoy the music. The people don't do that though. They want to they wanna police how everybody enjoys stuff. You can't enjoy this because of that. You can't enjoy that because of that. And it's just fucking bullshit. Because again, if we're going to do that, let's apply the rules for everybody the same, but we don't apply the rules for everybody. So I much prefer this. Now, if they stick with this, it's fine. Because it's easy to say this when it's Louis C.K. and it's Dave Chappelle and it's Marilyn Manson. They're all at the top of their craft or they're at the top of their industry or their genre or whatever, right? They're big stars. Most of them or all of them basically have made it basically, right? It's not as if this Grammy is really going to make any difference in their career. But will it be easy to do the same thing if it was like a 22-year-old guy? If it was somebody just coming up who didn't maybe have as much clout or maybe didn't have as much um, years in the game, would that be something they would do? Probably not. But still, I like this precedent being set. Let's keep all that stuff that happens outside of the art, outside of the art, because if we start looking back retrospectively and we start punishing people for what they do, you know, outside of their basic, you know, skill set and talent, then we're going to have to go back to the history books and start taking away people's Grammys. Do you know what I mean? And no one wants to have that conversation. We continue. The question of if and how award ceremonies should be addressed problematic nominees has been haunting other shows for the past few months, particularly in relation to Morgan Whalen, the country star who said a racial slur in February. While um, shows like the ACMA Awards removed him from the contention, the CMAs, of course they did, allowed his albums and songs to be nominated to recognise his collaborations, and the American Music Awards kept him in the chart-based categories, but all said he, sh um, he would not be allowed to attend. What's the point? So you keep him there to bring the eyes there, to make it a good vibe, to obviously, you know, add to your show, but then he can't perform on your stage. Like, nonsense. Again, if you're going to cancel Morgan Whalen for calling his white friend a nigger, which is, you know, whatever, well, who, who knows what's going on over there, then, then just say he can't perform flat out on all your things. But again, they enjoy the ears and the eyes that he brings to their stations and their sister sites and shit, and they don't want to let go of that Morgan Whalen though. So they continue doing this nonsense they're doing at the moment. And I absolutely hate it, man. I absolutely hate it. It's all selective nonsense. 
Um, while Wellen's case is obviously different from the other nominations, so musicians accused of abuse and assault, and Wellen, who also is fully eligible and a zero Grammy nomination. Mason Jr. hinted at similar restrictions on attendance. He says, what we will control is our stages, our shows, our events, our red carpets. We will look at our who, anyone who is asking to be part of that and asking to be attendance and we'll make our decision at the point. So if you're a problematic person and you make mu good music, they're going to include you in nominations. But if you're problematic and you're trying to attend, you can't come. How does that make sense? Again, let's apply the rules all, all across the board. If, you, if you've got a couple of cases on you for you know, um, domestic violence and they decide that's where they end and you can't be considered for a nomination then, take me off the thing completely. Don't invite me, don't nothing. But don't say, yeah, we can we can recommend your music. So what? You're gonna play my music. You're gonna play music from a domestic. You're gonna play music from a woman beater, you know, in the intermission during the shows on. But you're not allowing me to set set foot in there. What difference does that make? I'm still there. When my music comes on, people immediately think of me and what I've done and my actions because they're intrinsically linked. Just a whole not bag of nonsense. But again, I prefer this stance because I think cancel culture is gay, and I'd much prefer we live in a world where we decide we take personal responsibility and say if we don't like some of what they did outside of their art cool we don't listen to them but we also let others who enjoy that shit enjoy it and we also try to live in a world where if we don't have nothing to say and we're indifferent we just keep scrolling i don't understand this whole engaging thing with stuff that you don't like like if you don't like it just keep scrolling like i see players of instagram that i don't like i just keep moving you don't go on there and leave a bad comment you just keep it moving most people do but for some reason when it comes to these weird issues people suddenly start to get on their soapbox and to me it seems a bit barmy army but, you know, what can you do on that one? What can you do on that one? Uh, and then off the back of that, we've got this article courtesy of Pajaba, which if I'm not mistaken, oh, sorry, Pajiba, Pajaba, Pajiba, Pajaba, Pajiba, Pajaba, 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 or Pajiba, Pajiba. Let's say Pajiba. Can I say Pajiba probably? Pajiba! So Pajiba, I think, was a site that uh, basically cancelled um, Thingy for a bit, innit? Um, what's his name? Uh, something Kamal. Oh, what's that guy? The little short Asian dude who was on SNL. Was it SNL? No, what, what show was he on? He was on some series. I don't know. I don't, I don't watch these white people's comedy shows. But whatever, he was on some comedy show and people liked him. You know, people thought it was funny. And then I guess some girl decided to write an essay about how she had a clumsy hookup with a guy. That's what it sounded like, basically. A really clumsy hookup where no one really knew where the line was. No one really knew what people were comfortable with. It was a bit of on, off, on, off, on, off to the point where she was like, okay, now leave. And then, you know, she read about it. And again, up to you how you want to say it, but how you want to, you know, what you call it? How you want to, it's up to you how you want to interpret the story. But looking back on it, that wasn't worth somebody losing their career over. It wasn't worth public, you know, condemnation, public shaming, all that shit. It wasn't worth it. Um, even the attempt at cancellation wasn't worth it. It didn't make any sense because at the heart of it, it was a clumsy, awkward, bad first date or bad intimate date -y kind of thing, whatever, when you go on that third base sort of thing, you see somebody in your own home, or you see them in their own home, do you know what I mean? it gets to you know, ramp up the old sexual tension, and it can get a bit weird, and it can get a bit awkward, it can get a bit clumsy, because guess what, you know, relationship between men and women, or relationship between anybody that's into each other, is a bit strange, is a bit awkward, that first touch, that first kiss, that first intimate hug, it takes a while to build up to that point, and between then and that point, Loads of things can go wrong. Trust me, I've been there. I fumbled a bag many a times, very close to the, to the finishing line. <laughs> and I continue to do so. But anyway, continuing on. Uh, Pajabi had some... Pajaba... Pajiba... Just say the word. I can't say it properly. I don't, maybe because it's a hand. What's the hand mean? Isn't that a bad logo in terms of phonetically trying to spell the word? In your head even. What does that hand and a fist mean? That, that fist is holding a pencil, I'm assuming, right? What does that mean? How does that represent an eye? Anyway, let's continue. Um, they, had, they weren't really too pleased, obviously, with the fact that Louis C.K. and uh, Marilyn Manson and who else, uh, whoever else got a, a Grammy. Imagine how pissed they would have been if Kevin Spacey was awarded, you know, actor of the decade or something. <laughs> Uh, it continues it? Counterculture strikes again, Dustin Rolls says, for Pajiba. There we go, I got it. So they say here, Counterculture has once again reared its ugly head, this time taking aim at Marilyn Manson and Louis C.K., each of whom has a history of sexual abuse allegations against them, and Dave Chappelle, who's made and continues to make jokes at the expense of trans community. Proper narky, like, mm, you did something bad. Dude, I'm going to tell on you behavior, and it's like, 
Yeah, 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 man. Um, the Recording Academy is the latest to take aim at the free, announcing yesterday that each has received Grammy nominations. Lucy Kay and Dave Chappelle were nominated for the Best Comedy Album, while Marilyn Manson was twice nominated for contributions on the Yay Donda album. So, if you do something that people don't like, right? Again, because l- l- let's l- let me put my stand out there again. Like I said, I ultimately think cancel culture is gay because it's the industry deciding to counsel you and take away your ability to make money put food on the table pay your rent look after your kids and all that good stuff they are deciding i'm okay with the public saying hey we don't like this guy because he's a woman abuser we don't like this guy because he's homophobic we don't like her because she's a zionist whatever i don't care right if they if the public says i'm not gonna we're gonna collectively decide to not back this person's music and then they die a slow death so be it and if they, even if their fans turn against them, cool, right? That's fine, no problem. But the issue that I have, if you're a musician and you see something that people don't like, it's, it's not your fans turning against you because your fans usually don't care. Your fans love you for who you are, most of them, because they know who you are. Or your fans just ride or die and they're willing to, you know, whatever, ride or die. Or your fans are just grown ups and they're okay with separating the art and the artist. But in some cases, or in most cases, what ends up happening if you're somebody and you're a musician, for instance, you do something people don't like, the industry stops promoting your music you get bumped off the algorithm you're not featured on the new albums release thing page whatever on on spotify and apple you don't get booked on festivals anymore because sponsors and brands and stages think you're a liability um concert halls don't want to book anymore either off the back of that because they're getting bomb threats sent to them and shit so essentially there is a co um there is some sort of coordinated attack that happens in order to limit your ability to make a living they take away from you. Despite your fans saying, we're going to stick with you, the industry says no, which is what I think is gay. I don't like that whatsoever. I think that's horrible. That's horrible. That's super inhumane. It's lacking any kind of empathy. It's lacking any kind of um, understanding of redemption, right? Like, can somebody do something wrong and maybe come back from it? Probably. Can they do something wrong? Is there is there different levels of wrongness that you can do to come back from? Of course, there's always a limit. There's always a line. You have to decide what that line is for yourself. Everyone's got one. But in terms of collectively saying, they're all completely different. What? Louis C.K. did what? Louis C.K., if you look at the heart of the issue, he in- engaged in a sexual act with two consenting adults who then later on decided that they weren't that comfortable with it or maybe spoke about it in open. It was then taken and interpreted as another thing that he was going around jacking off in front of random people, which wasn't the case. It was one occasion that happened that was spoken about on a, on a podcast or something, repeated by other people that then took a life for its own and suddenly his career is gone. Okay, cool, whatever. Career gone. Dave Chappelle thing. He said a joke that you didn't like. A joke that he said you didn't find funny. You took it personally because he was talking to a, a group of people who you feel an affection for. Okay, cool. But is that worth to completely erase his career and say that he can't make a living again? Is that what you want? You're disappointed in people for just supporting him anyway because they don't care? Because the thing is all that pisses me off about people like that. They get annoyed at people that don't care. You're right to care, isn't it? Uh, Pajiba, they're all right. Do your articles. Say how much of a horrible person Dave Chappelle is. That's fine. That's your prerogative. But you then can't get angry at people who don't care what about what you're talking about. They're allowed to not give a shit. Yes, it's disappointing. Yes, you want people to have a more morals and more ethics and have informed choices in who they back. Yes, we'd love that. But we don't live in a perfect world. I mean, most grown-ups know this. Most grown-ups try to function in the world as is instead of trying to craft it and bend it to their will. That's not what most people do because you're going to be here forever and it's not going to work. And then lastly, the Marilyn Manson thing is a bit tetchy. It's a little bit the harder one to get into because, again, relationship stuff, we weren't, we weren't there. Um, the accounts, again, relationship stuff, we weren't there. It's Marilyn Manson. He's a bit of a freak and, a, and a, what, do you, what do you call it? He's a little bit of a... Um, He's a, he's a freak, basically, isn't it? Like, when stuff comes out about him that's verging on that sort of side of abuse and whatever it may be, and it seems a bit strange and a bit dark, you look at Marilyn Manson, you take a look at him, and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. So a part of you is a little bit like, it's hard to really make a, a fair judgment on that. And again, we don't really have the details. We don't really know what's going on. Was he going around with a bat suit, going around abusing people left, right, and center? Whole different story. Or were all these consensual adult relationships that maybe went a bit too far on his side of things? Cool, again, let's say that did happen. He did do that thing. He went too far in a few relationships. Again, is that worth cancelling somebody completely for? I don't think so, personally. 
I don't think so. Or if I think so, maybe there's a period and you can come back after that, but that's not the case. They want you to stop dead. They want you to stop and drop dead right at this moment. They don't think you can come back from it. That's the thing that I don't like, which is odd because people have family members who say the most wildest shit, but you don't want them to die, do you? You don't want them to just drop dead and die. You don't want them to just like not talk ever again. Or maybe you do. I don't know. Let's continue. It says here, um, that's going to put a real dent in their careers, said sarcastically, I'm assuming. It continues here. It says the following. Oh, that's a quote from him, from the uh, CEO. And then um, it continues on showing tweets. Is that what the articles are nowadays? You write an article, what? That's like how many words long? That's like less than 500 words, right? And then you just include tweets of other people, what they said. Okay, anyway. Um, in, in other words, the Recording Academy separates art from the artist, no matter how heinous the artist's action can be. And then um, tweets from different people. A guy called David Max says, only one Grammy nom for each Dave Chappelle and Kevin Hart and, and Lucy K. Counter Culture Strikes again. Um, and ironically, of course, 77.4K likes. Um, Eve Six says, what Counter Culture has done to these men is unconsolable. Um, 4.2 likes. Oh, because they're saying Counter Culture does exist. Yes, it does exist, though. We've seen so many accounts of people who are less famous than Dave Chappelle, Lucy K, Kevin Hart and Marilyn Manson who got cancelled and never came back from it ever again. Plenty of people who have said jokes online, on Twitter and shit. People have rung up their place of work. They got fired. Look at those people that, like, look at those guys. Um, Look at that guy that gave Chris Whitty a hug in the flipping park and it was kind of roughing him up and shit. People mass reported him to his work and they fired him. Did that guy get a job again? The job market is pretty tough out here in the UK, especially for like mid-level jobs in offices. It's not easy to get. Did that guy get a job easily? No, probably not. If Has he got a job? I don't know. If he hasn't, that's counterculture in effect. But people like to say because the biggest of the biggest didn't can get cancelled, that all of a sudden doesn't exist. It's like, what are you talking about? These guys are richer than most humans in the world. Of course, it's not going to hurt them the same way. But it's still something that you don't like to see. Somebody's career getting completely taken away from them because of they made a mistake or they fucked up. And again, that's what I'm saying. Cancel them if you were. If there was some sort of like um, mini cancellation that took place where like you were given a timeout, cool. But they don't want a timeout. They want you to time out forever. I mean, they don't want you to wake up. Um, it continues here. It says a, a, a person called Jesse De Het. Or Jesse, no, Jesse Het. Is it Jesse Het? Jesse the Helpman Het. It says, Lucy K is nominated for a Grammy this year. Another victim of counterculture. It's the same joke again and again. They include in this Pijabi flipping article. Um, Jeffrey Ignod said, um, every, you really can't tell me that counterculture doesn't exist when Lucy K, Dave, Dr. Luke and Dave Chappelle have all received Grammys. Lucy K can shove his Grammy and nomination up Mel Gibson's ass. I guess this person didn't like the passion of Christ. Um, this another one person said, Glock Ducey K and Marilyn Manson are both nominated Grammys, but tell me more. Mate, how many times are you going to repeat the same thing in this article? That's the article done. Fucking modern day journalism, isn't it? Absolutely weird. But yeah, um, Pajiba aren't fans of Lucy K, Dave Chappelle, or Marilyn Manson. I, I find it interesting they didn't use Dave Chappelle's face on here as the lead image for this article. I wonder why. Let's move on. Let's move on. Um, 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 yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's move to this one, even though it's not considerable news. So, this is news courtesy for UK listeners and people worldwide, just so you know what's going on here in the UK. It looks like that new strain of COVID called Omicron has found its way over here from South Africa, that home of Ama Piano. These guys are all like dancing out there. Do you know what I mean? Like, do you know what I mean? Doing the old, like, doing the old doing your thing and then suddenly they've brought this flipping omicron covid variant over i'm joking i don't know what happened with all that shit you know who knows if all this stuff is even real we don't know i'm joking but yeah um we got a new variant um new new measures have been put into place it looks like we're heading into a very cold and dark christmas and maybe new years Parts of Europe are closing and locking down. Hospitality industries are taking a hit. Clubs and bars are being closed left, right and centre. But for some reason, England is still standing strong. We might be the last bastion of hope. I was due to go to Berlin, I said already, in the first week of December. That's been put on kibbutz. I was also meant to go on New Year's Eve for the Club Sylvester parties. Or the, sorry, the Sylvester parties in um, Berkheim, but that's also been put on ice. I was also meant to be going to Kiev. Between then, that's also been put on ice. Um, so it looks like 
England might be the place to be if you're on a party, but it's going to be a bit dicey out there because this new rave, this new variant is looking like it's kicking everyone's ass and everyone's getting really worried. And I'm guessing because it's Christmas and people are going to be festive celebrations. No one wants to have COVID and not be able to communicate or be around people because that would be hell on earth. Do you know what I mean? I can't imagine anything worse. It continues, especially if you don't care about Christmas. Then it comes around and you can't actually see people. You're going to start caring. Um, it says here, Prime Minister sets out new measures as Omicron variant identified in the UK. It says the following, the Prime Minister has today confirmed... Um, um, new temporary and precautionary measures following the emergence of the Omicron variant in the UK. The Omicron variant contains a large number of spike protein mutations, as well as a mutation in other parts of the viral genome. Urgent work is ongoing internationally to fully understand how this mutation may change the behavior of the virus with regards to vaccines, treatments and transmissibility. Um, vaccines remain our best line of defense. Experts remain confident that our current vaccines will provide protection against a new variant, but the extent of this continues to be investigated. Over 16 million people have already come forward for their booster jabs and we've seen a fall in hospitalizations and deaths all adults who have not yet been recovered uh sorry who have not yet received their first or second doses of the vaccine or those who are eligible for the booster are encouraged to come forward and help protect themselves and others i'm just saying it flat out i'm not getting a booster they can go kiss my ass um i only got the vaccine in the first place because i was under some sort of illusion or idea that this is going to be a way for me to get back to normal for us to get back to normal um for life to carry on back as normal but it seems like there's never enough we've gone from needing one jab to needing two jabs what's the talk of this johnson johnson just taking one jab that's gone completely you need two jabs to be effectively covered now they're talking about boosters there's going to be a booster for the booster it's going to keep on going they're going to keep on flipping you know um uh, they're going to keep this tight control over our lives. They're not going to fucking let go it feels like it's annoying it really fucking is same flipping um same methods same prevention methods that they kind of using that haven't worked for the past two and a half years. I don't know, man. I don't know. Let's continue. Um, target measures will be introduced next week as a precaution to slow down the spread of the variant while we gather more information. Ah, oh, damn it. That probably means hospitality industry is going to take a hit next week. We're definitely going to see some sort of change, I'm assuming, whether it's curfews, whether it's reduced capacity, we're going to see something, man. I can't I can't for the life of me believe this Tory government that's incredibly anti-fun, that didn't give a shit about the hospitality industry throughout the entirety of the lockdown, didn't really mitigate, mediate or kind of meet those guys in the middle at all in terms of moving things forward. You saw the great work that Sasha Law did in terms of trying to communicate, you know, how great nightlife had been kind of dealing with COVID. That's all going to go out the window for, for sure. For sure. This, this weekend might be the last good weekend of parties and shit. Ah, oh, annoying. Let's say the bullet points as follows. All international arrivals must take a day two PCR test and self-isolate until they receive a negative COVID um, result. All contacts of suspected Omicron cases must self-isolate regard regardless of the vaccination status. They'll be contacted by NHS Test and Trace. Face coverings will be made compulsory in shops and public transport from next week. All hospitality settings will be exempt. So I don't get that. So you can have to wear a face covering when you're sitting down on the bus or the train or if you're going into a store to buy a pair of jeans or if you're going into a shop to buy a loaf of bread. But in the moment you go into a pub to get a burger and a beer, you don't need to wear a mask. Now that even means hospitality industries are going to close from next week or they're going to curtail it for some way, shape or form in terms of curfews or earlier, whatever, yeah, something along those or reduced serving times. Or they're legitimately going to try and just like, wallahi vibes this the whole way through which I don't have a problem with because that means I can still go out. But the issue I have with it is twofold. The approaches that they keep using don't work, obviously, right? It's that whole Albert Einstein insanity quote. That's one thing. Secondly, when they do do the approaches, they're all quite backwards. Like face coverings to be worn everywhere, but you're allowed, to wear, you're allowed not to wear them in, hospital, in bars and restaurants. Huh? Please, someone make that make sense. Why? Where, where did where did where did they get these findings that somehow the virus travels easier on tr public transport? It doesn't doesn't in a pub in a bar, which by definition I would assume, or by the law of averages, I would imagine most more there's probably more public transport options that have better ventilation systems than there are restaurants and bars, especially ones in London because they're usually built in buildings that are super old, right? So ventilation is not going to be the greatest. I understand if the restaurant, you're going to have to have some good ventilation in order to get good um, rating in terms of health and safety. But I'd imagine the ventilation needed in order to make sure you don't get COVID, public transport is probably the best place to go, especially if you're on a bus. But for whatever reason, 
Restaurants are exempt to wearing face coverings. I don't get it. Anyway, it continues. Six million booster jabs will be available in England. Again, don't care about that. All over the three ne next three weeks. And the health secretary has today asked um, JV1 or JVI, I guess, to consider rapidly extended um, boosters as well as reducing the gap between the second dose and the booster. Two cases of the Omicron variant were today identified in Essex and Nottingham. Target testing and contract testing is now underway. So yeah, a flipping dark winter coming up. It's up to you what you do now going forward. I think everyone's sort of future and health and safety is in your own hands. you got the information to hand from the government. You now decide what you do. Do you heed the instructions? Do you, um, do you rebel? Do you just continue as per normal? Everyone's got to make their own decision because I've got a feeling nowadays the compliance rate, I'd imagine, even with the goody tutors is low. Even though that being said, I have seen an, a real uptick in people around just wearing a mask in the supermarket. I think that's definitely a change I've seen, um, you know, in part from the last two weeks or so. When I went to do a quick bit of shopping yesterday in the supermarket, I did notice a lot more people wearing a face covering. So maybe that's a consequence of this new variant. People are a bit, again, people are worried because we're in the holiday season. No one wants to be cooped up at home on their own, not be able to see people in their family and shit. No one wants that. So maybe that's something going forward. But again, man, I'm done, man. I've got, I've got COVID fatigue. I've got lockdown fatigue. I don't give a shit. I'm going to, of course, keep myself to myself for the most part. I'm still locked in place. Whenever I need to go out, I'll go out. But in terms of making any wide sweeping changes in terms of my overall habits and stuff, no, nah, I'm not for it. Of course, when I have to wear a mask, I'll wear it. But everything else, I'm done. I've already got my jabs. I've got my vaccine passport, which is already an intrusion in my privacy. Something that I definitely didn't agree with, but I wanted to do it in order to kind of be you know, lend myself to some sort of collective team spirit to get us back to some semblance of normality. But it looks like the powers that be just refuse to let us go, man. They refuse to let that vice grip they have on our lives go. And it's fucking frustrating. I can't lie, man. It's fucking frustrating. Quickly speak about this. It's epic picture courtesy of Dasha from uh, Red Scare Podcast. She stands alongside Alex Jones and Anna, also from Dasha. And they had a pretty interesting, wide-ranging interview with um, Alex Jones. Uh, I think it's in part due to his documentary coming out called Alex's War sometime in early, I think next year or something, to 2022, I think I saw on the flyer. And the interview is fucking awesome. i got to be honest. This picture, when it went um, on socials and everyone saw it, it kind of broke my side of Twitter and the internet a little bit. Um, all these kind of social commentator, you know, dirtbag leftists, kind of, you know, dusty white people who look like they only smoke rolling cigarettes or vape a lot and drink coffee and drink m espresso martinis and shit. You know, those kind of dusty white people, isn't it? Um, the kind of ones that ironically know all the lyrics of Damn from Kendrick Lamar and that kind of vibe, right? Those kind of guys, um we're all going got their panties in a twist about this issue but i really enjoyed it man i'm a big fan of red scare anyway i love the podcast listen to it quite often it took me a while to get past the vocal fry shit with these girls um it's fucking annoying and the pace of how they speak but once you start getting used to their tone of voice um their humor or their sense of humor and ov overall you start to kind of forget about the vocal fry um you start to forget about the some bits of pretentiousness that lie in there and you just enjoy it for what it is a kind of art ho culture podcast where they sort of talk about things that they're into things that they've seen great recommendations along the way great chat and just kind of two girls kind of figuring it out as they go along um and i love it i got to be honest i'm a big fan of it i never missed an episode i backed them on patreon i love everything about it and i saved this um alex jones interview for a while i think it's been a week now uh, maybe, uh five days of, of course i think maybe less than a week if i was that longer than a week in the internet age but it's about two hours long and it's really good um the director of the documentary also pipes in here and there but she does really well in terms of just letting alex have the have the have the floor but she does ask some great questions and just kind of offer some insight in terms of the documentary but i thought in terms of humanizing alex jones this might have done a better job maybe because it's two women and he was kind of flirting super heavily with um dasha i'm assuming dasha must look slightly like his wife maybe alex jones has a thing for blondes or just in general he's you know he's had a crush on dasha since the infamous days of her doing that video with the info words girl which was wearing that sailor outfit i don't know but he was flirting quite heavily with her which was quite cute and gross to kind of hear um audio wise right audio aud hearing somebody flirt just without seeing the visual of it cringes you out more than it, you think it would do 
right? It does. I don't know why. Because you can't really see the face. You don't really know what's going on. She, I mean, you know, that just seemed a little, uh, that should just seem um, flattered by the interest or by the compliments, which was nice to see. But anyway, in general, the interview was great. I think it humanized Alex Jones in a way that no other interview has. I think a lot of that had to do with the strong female energy that he got from both of these women and the fact that they both came in there with good intentions. I think that kind of radiated in the podcast. I think also he's probably in the stage of his life considering the lawsuits he's going through and the fact that he lost, I think, one recently. Um, he's probably going to have to pay massive amounts of fines and shit. Like he's on, you know, he's on a bit of a, He's on a bit of a tilt at the moment. He's probably kind of mellowed out as well over the years, especially off the back of all that Sandy Hook nonsense, which I still think has to go down to one of his biggest fuck ups ever. Do you know what I mean? That whole, you know, basically saying, you know, the you know, the children that died in that tragedy were fucking crisis actors is just fucking what whatever he said in that mark was just fucking insane. I can only imagine what a parent um of one of those kids that died can feel about Alex Jones when they're seeing him plastered all over the media and the press. But Again, I'm a big fan of redemption. I think people should be given second chances. I don't think you should be judged solely based on the worst thing that you you have done in your life. I think people are more layered and interesting or... No, people are more layered than that or more complex. I also think life isn't that binary, isn't that black and white, isn't that simple. Just because some person did that thing doesn't necessarily mean they don't have a right to live or exist. I think people have a right to live and exist and to, ex and to have an opportunity to kind of redeem themselves in some way, shape or form, especially if they're trying their best to correct the wrongs that they've done in the past. And I think for the most part, um, he has tried to do that. He even distanced himself from Trump. That's how bad it got, right? He even, even denounced Trump. Yeah, man, I never thought that would happen. So that was a big deal in terms of Alex Jones. But again, I thought it was a really interesting podcast, very wide ranging interview. Great to get some of his thoughts and feelings on certain things. There are parts where you kind of zone out and he kind of rambles into, you know, into nothing space. But again, it's just Alex Jones is what he does. But I think the girls do a good job in terms of tethering him and kind of asking him some really um, interesting questions. He opens up a bit personally about some stuff that he probably hasn't done in the past. And all in all, a very enjoyable interview I honestly have to say I really enjoyed it I have to be honest I thought it was really good I didn't really get all the backlash and the attention people were saying I guess it's because of what he represents what he said in the past nowadays if you stand next to somebody that people don't like automatically you are also somebody that should be denounced and cancelled and not allowed to earn a career and stuff which is probably why they're they're I would imagine Anna and Dash are probably thanking their lucky stars that they started, they started the Patreon when they did, right? Instead of just relying on sponsors and doing what everyone else does on podcasts, they went straight to the um, crowdfunding sort of model so that now they're in a position where like, as long as their fans like what they're doing, it doesn't matter what everyone else says. Do you know what I mean? That's the major thing. They don't have to kowtow or bow to sponsors and shit. They can just stick to what they do. But then the other thing they got the issue with is that because of what they speak about and maybe their opinions are a little bit grating, they can't operate on the mainstream platforms, right? I think they tried to set up a shop, a Shopify when they first launched their merch and Shopify deleted their their account because I guess people complained and said, how can you house these people? Blah, 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 blah. And they got kicked off for then. They had to set up a new thing, right? So that that's the only issue that you kind of run into when you are outspoken or you kind of operates on the fringes and that sort of stuff but the good thing is that you get the freedom to do and say what you want and create cool content this is cool content man they got to hang out with alex jones they got to shoot guns with him you know um talk about his life and shit like got some great photo opportunities i thought personally it was a really really good interview i really really enjoyed it man but maybe i'm in the minority i really enjoyed it check it out if you haven't given it a chance and obviously try and give it a chance red scare podcast available on most streaming platforms and all that shit but yeah, what else we got to talk about here? One second, bear with me. Let me just double check and make sure everything's okay. Yes, it is. Cool, let's do this. Let's move on. What else we got to talk about here? Yay, let's talk about this. My favorite topic I want to talk about. My favorite topic. My favorite topic. My, my favorite topic. Techno Twitter news. So, it looks like Azealia Banks has fell out with somebody else. Is there like a running tally of people Azealia Banks has fallen out with in public? How she's dared to have arguments with people that she knows who also happen to be famous. People get annoyed about that a lot, right? They're like, oh, she must be a terrible human being. She falls out with people all the time publicly. It's like, maybe it's different for her because she's a celebrity. She's well known. So by proxy, you'd imagine she knows a lot of other people who are also well known. So because of that, your relationships are going to be public anyway. So if you're going to have love publicly, why not have the backlash and the fallout and the degradation of the relationship out in public too? Why not? Fuck it. You know what I mean, if we're going to kiss and make up, or if you're going to kiss and stand 
clicked up on the wall and pose, you know, for the gram in public. When we're going to have it out, let's have it out in public too. Let me get on my Instagram and let's rant and rave. You know what I mean? Let's tag each other. Let me call you names and shit. You know what I mean? Let me call you names. If there's one person who's an expert at calling names, the pinnacle, the Michael Jordan at calling people names, it's Azealia Banks. And recently she happened to hanging out with Flippin' Kobolsi. I think it was maybe a couple of weeks ago. I remember seeing the pictures of it on Instagram thinking, what the fuck? What the fuck are they doing together? Then, of course, I read they were doing some collaboration. Maybe he was doing some remixes, some work, whatever, innit? Well-known DJ, producer, artist, cool. It makes sense. She's in music too. They're going to hang out. They're going to work something out. It's all good. But, you know, just in terms of the worlds that they operate in, he's in techno, she's in whatever she's in. You didn't think there'd be many links between them, but I guess music is music. Let's do some work. Let's hang out. So it's a great picture, right? Great photo op. They're, they're smiling, chilling, having a good time. Azealia Banks' tatas are looking primed. Kabosi's dressed in head-to-toe black with that garbage. What's that thing called? that Techno Palace brand that he has that he started, right? Um, going on, chilling, doing his thing. And you're thinking all things are going to be good, in it? All things are going to be good. But no, just a few days later, <laughs> for whatever reason, Azalea Banks went on the fucking offensive and just started torching Kobosi on her fucking um, Instagram saying these various things, which somebody gratefully decided to screen grab for the um, sanctity of internet history. So it says the following. She screenshotted... Um, this post somebody else uploaded, I guess, on Instagram, where it says blues came from black culture, jazz came from black culture, rock and roll came from black culture, funk came from black culture, soul came from black culture, hip hop came from black culture, disco came from black culture, house came from black culture, techno came from black culture, junk came from black culture, drum bass came from black culture, garage came from black culture, gram culture, dubstep came from black culture. Dubstep came from black culture, and then white people just made bass, didn't it? Who said that to me? Someone said that to me, right? Why like someone said that? But people made dubs on dub sips, so why people just went bass? Oh, that was a good one. But anyway, continue. That's what she. That's what the original post is. And on top of it, Azalea Banks says the followings. Are you guys ready for Kobolsi's preset techno set at Time Warp tomorrow? Preset. So you remember what everyone else was accusing people were accusing. We have to give. We have to. We have to all take a step back and forgive and extend our apologies to some of these techno whitey girls right out there. The who can I think of? The Deborah the Lucas, right? All those like, you know, twirly fingered girls out there, right? We have to maybe give them some credit because people were accusing those girls of having ghost producers and of having pre recorded or pre set sets, right? Where they'd either have their sets all kind of timed out in terms of cue points, they're not doing much, or they just play a recorded set on the USB and make it look like they're mixing live on the stage, but they're not actually mixing. That's what people, you know, would always say. So it's always flawless every time they played. And everyone would accuse those girls of doing it because for some reason people have a hang up and they think girls can't DJ. When in fact, it's the guys. It's the guys who people actually respect are the ones doing it, according to Azealia. Anyway, it continues. She says at the bottom, he purposely broke his laptop at our session today because I wouldn't agree to a 25% um, of whatever we worked on. He asks for an OB6 synth, which I guess is a piece of equipment. We got him an OB12, which I'm guessing is something above. You know, maybe, I don't know how it, work, how it works out. And his stupid ass says, I didn't have enough space on my laptop to install the driver for it. Clever, clever, snaky kind of guy, if this is true, right? Goes to work with somebody, doesn't agree on the terms before he gets out there. Then in an effort to sabotage the recording session, purposely breaks his computer in an effort to get out of the deal scumbag behavior if true again this is only one person's account i'm just reporting the news here right who am i to judge you not judge every single day next slide um azelia bank says the following regarding kobolsi um she says kobolsi and tags him aren't you the same idiot who got fired from Bergheim for snorting copious amounts of cocaine not a lot not tiny not bags copious Copious is like unending, you know that, that's what that means, of cocaine and inviting ugly prostitutes into a club. Ugly prostitutes, I didn't even know they existed. I thought all prostitutes and sex workers were the apple of God's eye. That's what I thought. <laughs> but that funny, that story from Bergam is funny because that I remember seeing um all over socials when i kind of first got on techno twitter techno twitter right wherever that is you have to follow a couple of people to get what techno twitter is but basically it's like people in techno complaining about shit but essentially i remember that story going viral for a bit in 2019 and the story goes that kobosi is known to be some sort of bad boy in techno again because he just looks a little bit like a ragamuffin and he dresses in all black and he's aggressive leaning with tattoos and shit people think he's fucking what some sort of gangster or some shit it's like huh 
juggle. And if anything, this is like, if anything, I always thought of Kobolsi in that label he does, like, as like a techno version of like Palace. Do you know what I mean? Just regular guys from like middle class families trying to cosplay as working class. That's what it felt like to me. Whatever the European version of that is, where they all wear tracksuits and drive like vintage BMWs and wear sovereign rings and tuck their tracksuits into their white socks. Like, Jogon, Jogon, do you know what I mean? You went to a private school, your mum teaches fucking physics and eating and some shit, and now here you are saying, you know, blood, wagwan, and all this sort of shit in your lingo and stuff like, come on, get off of it, mate, get off of it. Do yourself a favour, give your head a wobble, you're not from ends. Um, but that's what I always thought. I always thought that brand that he had, I don't know what it's called. It's like that PKR thing that everyone works to wear. And because it's basically like a techno palace because everyone walks around and likes to get their picture taken with it on the back and shit. It always sells out because he probably makes 10 t-shirts or some shit. You know what I mean? It's like, girl. It's a, it, all that techno bad boy things where it's music, man. Honestly, just because you wear black and you might be tall and you've got a beard doesn't mean you're about anything. Let, let's, let's, be, let, let's be real. Like, it's just all nonsense. Because I guess in techno, you can do that because people that go to techno parties legitimately don't give a shit about all that. So if you have a bit of bass in your voice, you could probably strip most people in techno clubs. I get it. But still, relax. Listen to the music and do your things. But I love the copious amounts of cocaine. That's a big word, man. Because that means a lot. That means he was doing bears and, and ugly prostitutes. Ugh. Do they even exist? Um, let's continue. The nerve you suggest... Um, she says on a, on a story, let's, I'll read the whole thing, I won't keep stopping. Um, the nerve of you to suggest that I pay you 20k um, for your present only to present the most boring, dated, cliche, pseudo-techno bullshit to me. As if I'm stupid enough not to know what good music is, which I like what she says there. Um, you know, music is music. I am the reason you're getting paid to play Miami this weekend. Bow your head to the fucking pavement and kiss the ground I walk on. Now, this is interesting, state of affairs, right, development. Sorry, I interrupted again. I was meant to read the whole thing. But in one sense, having a relationship with Azalea Banks is quite fraught because if you fall out of each other, she's going to blast you all over her social media. But then it also seems like she's very, very giving. She'll invite you to her home. You go out with a drink with her. If, you, if you're down in the dumps and you say you're not getting any more gigs and you really want to play somewhere out in America, she'll put in a call to somebody and he'll book you like on the spot and give you money and put money in your pocket and shit like so she's got a big heart but she's the kind of person where she loves hard and if you cross her sh you're dead you know what I mean you're d-e-a-d -E you're dead um, it continues um da -da -da -da. you should be lucky if um lust work the legend great album out at the moment go check it out and um, would even share a sound pack with you it was Azalea Banks that hit David from space and got you that Miami gig. They didn't want you there. You stupid manager has absolutely no pull in this country. Jesus, even the manager got it. The nerve of you to say Shlomo, whoa, is only worthy of 100 euros and played out because he is a father. God damn, there's inner DJ beef now. What? So Kobosi doesn't like Shlomo. What? Because Shlomo's kind of taken over because Shlomo is effectively like a well-behaved Kobosi, isn't it? Right? He basically is a well-behaved um, well-liked Kabosi, it feels like. Because whenever you see Shlomo and you see him around other people, they seem to generally enjoy his company. He seems to see smiles. People like him. He seems to be very professional. He's great on. He's a great follow on Instagram in terms of how he sees his journey going to a gig. You see him with his kid, great dad. Looks up like, by the looks of it. He's basically a. You know, he's basically um. He's basically um. What you call it? <laughs> basically, you could say Kobolsi's evil Shlomo, right? That's basically what he is. <laughs> they continue. Um, you sound like a jealous, brought worse eating fat boy with dead sperm. Yo. Azalea's got a word with words. Oh, that's got way with words, man. She is a fucking wordsmith. My word. You sound like a jealous, brought worse, eating fat boy with dead sperm. That is mad. You know why it's mad? Because included in there is a barb or a jab that only people that are close to Kabosi would know, which I'm assuming is the dead sperm thing, right? I'm assuming that's a true statement that she included in there just to be extra mean. Just to extra get you in the ribs. Like, fuck me, mate. Shlomo is fertile and miles more talented than you are. All caps. You'll never be Shlomo. You're nothing without Rosa Schutz. Oh, Roseanne Schutz. Yeah, that's that's that girl, right? How do you pronounce her name? Okay, the other artist. Right, man. She's, going, she's tagging and blasting everybody. And will never be anything more than a sweaty Nazi. <laughs> the idea of the image of a sweaty Ketfield Nazi is crazy, isn't it? Because wasn't... Um, 
wasn't Hitler addicted to what was he addicted to? Was it meth? Right, supposedly, right? They said he was addicted to meth or something that they used to do back in the day recreationally. I think if you watch some old videos of his, that's why he's like, you know, ranting and raving and twitching bears and sweating and shit. Supposedly he's a meth head, isn't it? So her saying sweaty meth, sweat, sweaty Nazi is funny because, you know, there's an in, in, a indication there that she's taking a piss out of his ketamine use, which I don't, which I would not have, okay? No one shall, diff, you know, no, no, no one shall um, insult the uh, beauty of ketamine. Um, let's continue. Uh, it says here the next one. Uh, Roseanne birthed you, Kabosi, who he robbed out of her master ownership and only left over twenty five percent pub split. Ouch! While also calling her ugly and desperate at dinner. Oh my god! No, she aired out all the drama, all the while not knowing the difference between master splits and publishing himself. Um, absolutely no one wants to wear your garbage supreme for ketamine addicts. I told you about the ketamine thing. <laughs> I, I said it was basically yeah okay supreme for ketamine addicts i'd say it's um palace for techno freaks right basically attempt at clothing line kabosi and how dare you diss lust work glacier lust work has um can make an entire completely analog album in 24 hours you don't even own a hard drive you bomb no she didn't say that but yeah wow what a turn of events what a turn of events First, they went from hanging out and being the best of friends here to suddenly her telling him he's a sweaty, sweaty Nazi. Um, you know, he's rude to his label mates and artists. Um, he, he's got a brand that looks like Supreme for ketamine addicts. He's got no talent. He does pre-recorded a pre... What did you say about the set? That was interesting there. Is it a pre-loaded set? What was the first thing here? Are you guys ready for a preset techno set at Time Warp? Preset. God damn it, man. Abuse, abuse, abuse. But yeah, who do you think won in this fight versus Kabosi and Lazele Banks? It's pretty one-sided, obviously, because Lazele Banks hit him with a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 combo. But do you think Lazele Banks went too far? Do you think Kabosi had it coming? Do you care? Um, oh, yeah, the Bergheim story. Could you end on that one? What's the Bergheim story? End There's not much to say about that, really. The only development on that, I think, is I tried to look at Kabosi on the Bergheim website and boom, he's not there anymore. He's not listed as an artist on their listing anymore, but he has played there. So either he's lost his residency and he's still guesting on there off the back of that incident, or he's just not part of the team anymore and he's have to seek pastures new. But I wonder if that incident has sullied his name in the scene and people have stopped booking him in general because he's badly behaved. Because that was a weird one when it came out because I think that was another indication because again, I don't know anything behind the scenes that goes on in there in Bergheim. But that was another indication of like how tight of a ship they run and also quite refreshing that the rules apply for everybody. You're not really allowed to do drugs on the dance floor in any club in Berlin in general. They mostly tell you to go to the toilets and respect the space that you're in and respect your patrons, which everyone always keeps to the rules. But some people sometimes get a bit larry, especially us Brits, because we, we are known, we love a little bit of a key bump on the dance floor. But usually if you're well behaved, if you're in a club, usually another person who's not even a, 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 who's not even a flipping, who doesn't even work there will come up to you and say, hey, don't do that. You're going to ruin it for everybody. Go in the toilets. So you usually get told once at least, or you see everyone else doing it and you kind of acquiesce and you do do so but there is a little back in the head and you're thinking hold on i bet the dj don't have to do that i bet the guests people don't have to do that but it's not everyone has abided by the rules there is no such thing as breaking the rules maybe there's a green room you can maybe do some of that shit in maybe in the burger and it does exist i don't know i doubt it because why would you want to get that risk but for the most part everyone has to abide by the rules i know another rule they have there as well is that if you're not DJing, you're not allowed behind the booth. Usually to stand there and dance like other clubs are. Um, only back to back, you know, another guy, lads, girl, lads stand there. But usually they don't like just random people to stand there. They want to have just a person DJing there. And I think it actually looks better as a club to see actually one person playing and the whole crowd rocking and swaying and shit. That's always good to see. Um, that's great. But it was quite refreshing to see rules applying to everybody. So either he's got kicked off and he's not a resident anymore or he still gets there when he needs to be, or that affair just sully his name in general. But I'm interested to know, man, what happened in between that would have done it. Something else must have happened on top of what she said in terms of getting them where they are at. But bloody hell, mate, Azalea Banks absolutely destroyed Kobosi. And I got to be honest, it was quite entertaining to watch. It was quite entertaining to watch. But yeah, man, that might be where I'm going to end it there. Agassino Zinga show number 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 yeah Agassino Zinga show episode number what five two two in it thanks again for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's your first time tuning into the show please make sure you like subscribe and all that good shit I'd greatly appreciate it please if you can like and subscribe and I'll see you guys again on the other side.
Right, she's on the other side. Yeah, I'll see you on the other side. Or should I just continue? I'll see you on the other side. I'll see you on the other side. Take care, guys. Be safe, man. Be safe.